um, some aesthetics and architecture a critical option. Please join me in welcoming Richard Schusterman. Um, th thank you very much, Kari. I'd like to thank the organizers, um, Herr Rector Zimmermann, um, and the other organizers. I'd like to give a special thanks to uh, Olaf Pfeiffer, who helped me um, considerably by providing me with a lot of texts that he thought would be helpful um, for preparing this lecture, texts that I think were based on a course he was teaching um, this semester to prepare his students for this conference. And so in some way, um, this paper is, I guess, my, my uh, seminar arbeit um, f for this course. Uh, let me say one other thing. Um, of a pretext, a paratext, um, before I get into the paper itself. Um, the subtitle is A Critical Option. Um, I'm going to propose one critical mode among many. Uh, it's not the only good critical mode. It's not a foolproof critical mode, but I think it's a helpful one, and it's a relatively new one. Uh, when I was reviewing the uh, literature on criticality in architectural theory, one thing that struck me and disappointed me was um, there was a tendency that if one particular model of uh, critical architecture was found inappropriate, unsatisfactory, or outmoded, then there seemed to be a jump to the conclusion that criticality is no longer possible, viable, or useful. Um, so I want to make it clear that um, in proposing um, this option, the some aesthetic option, I am not contesting the value of other critical approaches. Uh, life is very difficult. We need to have a lot of different tools in our critical toolbox, um, one size does not fit all in clothing and in social and artistic problems. So now I'm going to read um, my paper. There are no images. Uh, rest your retina, um, but when you use your eyes, you're also using your occipital muscles, which can cause great fatigue and headaches. Um, you're welcome also to close your eyes and just listen. If you fall asleep, I won't be offended. Uh, if you fall asleep, you probably need to sleep. And my purpose here is to provide learning that is comfortable. And uh, that's the environment that I think learning is best pursued. This paper explores the value of some aesthetics for architecture, paying special attention to its potential application to the vexed issue of architecture's critical role. Some aesthetics can be briefly defined as the critical study and meliorative cultivation of how we experience and use the living body or soma as a site of sensory appreciation, aesthesis, and creative self-fashioning. It is therefore also concerned with the knowledge, discourses, practices, and bodily disciplines that structure such somatic care or can improve it. Some aesthetics is thus a discipline that comprises both theory and practice. The latter clearly, implies in, clearly implied in its idea of meliorative cultivation. The term soma indicates a living, feeling, sentient, purposive body rather than a mere physical body that could be devoid of life and sensation. While the aesthetic in some aesthetics has the dual role of emphasizing both the soma's perceptual role, whose embodied intentionality contradicts the traditional mind-body di dichotomy, and the soma's aesthetic uses in stylizing oneself and one's environments, but also in appreciating the aesthetic qualities of other selves and other things. Emerging from my work in pragmatist aesthetics, some aesthetics aims to overcome the rejection of functionality, embodiment, and desire 
that largely defines the Western tradition of philosophical aesthetics from Shaftesbury and Kant through Schopenhauer and into the present, despite the fact that body and desire are so prominent in Western art and literature, even in its religious forms. Some aesthetics is a complex field with three fundamental branches that involve multiple aspects. Analytic some aesthetics explores the diverse forms of somatic perceptions and practices and their function in our knowledge and construction of reality. I'm simplifying a great deal here for the sake of time. Pragmatic some aesthetics is a more normative branch with methods of somatic improvement and their comparative critique. Over the course of history, a vast array of methods have been recommended to improve our bodily experience and use. We can distinguish between holistic methods and more atomistic methods that focus on particular body parts or surfaces. Somatic practices can also be classified in terms of being directed primarily at the individual practitioner herself or instead primarily at others. A massage therapist or a surgeon works on, other, on others, but in doing Tai Chi Chuan or bodybuilding, one is working more on oneself. The distinction between self-directed and other-directed somatic practices cannot be rigidly exclusive, since many practices are both. Applying cosmetic makeup is frequently done to oneself and to others, and the erotic arts display a simultaneous interest in both one's own experiential pleasures and one's partners by maneuvering the bodies of both self and other. Moreover, just as self-directed disciplines like dieting or bodybuilding often seem motivated by a desire to please others, so other directed practices like massage may have their own self-oriented pleasures. Despite these complexities, which stem in part from the interdependence of self and other, the distinction between self-directed and other directed body disciplines is useful for resisting the common presumption that to focus on the soma implies a selfish retreat from the social. My professional training as a somatic educator and therapist has taught me the importance of caring for own, one's own somatic state in order to pay proper attention to one's client. In giving a Feldenkrais lesson of functional integration, I need to be aware of my own body positioning and breathing the tension in my hands and other body parts, and the quality of contact that my feet have with the floor in order to be in the best condition to assess the client's body tension, muscle tonus, and ease of movement, and thus to move the client in the most effective way. I need to make myself somatically comfortable in order not to be distracted by my own body tensions and in order to communicate effectively with my client. Otherwise, when I touch him, I will be passing on to him my own feelings of somatic tension and unease. Somatic disciplines can be further classified as to whether their major orientation is toward external appearance or inner experience. Representational some aesthetics, such as cosmetics, is concerned more with the body's surface forms, while experiential disciplines, such as yoga or Zen meditation, aim more at making us feel better in both senses of that ambiguous phrase, to make the quality of our somatic experience more satisfying and also to make it more acutely perceptive. Much of my recent book, Body Consciousness, A Philosophy of Mindfulness in Somesthetics, focuses on the project of experiential somesthetics through examining the modes and uses of heightened somatic consciousness as a way of critically analyzing and resisting contemporary culture's obsessive focus on advertised representations of external body norms of beauty that are oppressively used to stimulate feelings of inadequacy that impel us to buy products in the usually hopeless quest to meet those somatic norms. Of course, the distinction between representational and experiential somesthetics is one of dominant tendency rather than a rigid dichotomy. Somatic practices typically have both representational and experiential aspects and rewards because there is a basic complementarity of representation and experience, outer and inner. How we look influences how we feel and vice versa. 
Practices like dieting or bodybuilding that are initially pursued for representational ends often produce inner feelings that are then sought for their own experiential sake. Just as somatic disciplines of inner experience often use representational cues, such as focusing attention on a body part in meditation, so a representational discipline like bodybuilding deploys experiential clues to serve its ends of external form using critically trained awareness of muscular feelings to distinguish, for example, the kind of pain that builds muscle from the kind of pain that indicates injury. This paper will suggest how heightened experiential somesthetic awareness can be critically deployed in the experience and design of architecture, which in turn could enhance architecture's critical power in promoting more discriminating somesthetic awareness and thus improved critical cognition among architecture's various publics. Besides the analytic and pragmatic branches of somesthetics, we also need what I call practical somesthetics, which involves actually engaging in programs of disciplined, reflective, corporeal practice aimed at somatic self-improvement, whether representational, experiential, or performative. The dimension of not just discoursing about somesthetic disciplines, but systematically performing them is too often neglected in academic approaches to embodiment, but it is crucial to the concept of somesthetics as practice as well as theory. So that's um, somesthetics in a very brief summary. Somesthetics should be pertinent for architecture if the soma is. And though this pertinence should be obvious to all of you, let me briefly highlight some features of the soma's architectural centrality. First, the body is a primary and pervasive symbol for buildings and notions of tectonic beauty. As Plato analogized the body's architectural structure to a prison, so Vitruvius and St. Paul highlighted the body-temple analogy. Vitruvius in terms of their attractively symmetrical proportions of parts to whole, while Paul emphasized, I quote from Corinthians 1, 6.19, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost that is in you, end of quote. This analogy gets secularized by the time of Sigmund Freud, whose interpretation of dreams identifies the house as the dream work symbol for the body, the place where one's far from immaculate psyche is housed. Besides this symbolic linkage, the Soma fundamentally shapes some of the most basic concepts of architectural design. Consider the following features, and I'm sure you know them, but as Wittgenstein said, the role of the philosopher is to collect reminders for a particular purpose. So consider the following features. One, if architecture is the articulation of space for the purposes of enhancing our living, dwelling, and experience, then the Soma provides the most basic tool for all spatial articulation, by constituting the point from which space can be experienced and articulated. To see the world at all, we must see it from some point of view, a position that determines our horizon and directional planes of observation, that sets the meaning of left and right, up and down, forward and backward, inside and outside, and eventually shapes also the metaphorical extensions of these notions in our conceptual thought. The soma supplies that primordial point of view through its location both in the spatio-temporal field and in the field of social interaction. Two, our lived experience of space essentially involves distance, and it is through the soma's powers of locomotion that we get our sense of distance in space. The soma is thus what enables us to appreciate not only the visual effects and structural design features that rely on perceiving distance and depth, but also the multi-sensorial feelings of moving through space with their kinesthetic, tactile, proprioceptive qualities that are crucial to the experience of living with, in, and through architecture. The concrete living space that the Soma architecturally defines is not an abstract, fully homogeneous space, but rather a space shaped by the body's directionality with its front, sides, and back. The essential architectural feature of facade expresses this notion of directional facing. Three, if architecture involves mass as well as space, 
then the soma likewise provides our most immediate sense of mass and volume. We feel the solid mass and thickness of our body. We also feel the liquids and gases that move through its volume. If verticality is basic to architecture, then the body is our basic experiential model of verticality and of the need to both deploy and resist gravitational forces to achieve it. The soma's vertical posture and ability to maintain it in locomotion not only enables the particular perspective we have in seeing, but also is what frees our hands so that we can use them to handle objects more effectively so as to draw, design, and build skillfully. Moreover, the architecture of the body, the fact that we are essentially top-heavy, our heavier head, shoulders, and torso resting on our significantly less massive legs, is part of what impels the soma to move, since its vertical equilibrium is more easily sustained in motion than in standing still. It is hard to stand motionless in place for more than a few minutes, but we can enjoy walking for much longer periods without any strain. Four, key principles of architectural form, as Vitruvius long ago remarked, seem derived from the soma. I quote, without symmetry and proportion, there can be no principles in the design of any temple, he argues, defining these formal features in terms of the relation between the building's different parts to the general magnitude of the whole. I'm quoting him again, as in the case of a well-shaped man, and justifying this relational principle on the grounds that, I quote again, nature has designed the human body so that its members are duly proportioned to the frame as a whole, end of quote. He likewise claims the basic forms of circle and square can be derived from the body, as can the basic notions of measurement needed in design. A case for the Soma's role in determining architectural scale could similarly be made just as one could argue that the body centrally informs the architectural feature of pillars which Vitruvius saw as imitating male or female forms. Point five. Despite its non-discursive materiality, which suggests mute dumbness, architecture as artistic design is expressive. The Soma's non-discursive expressivity through gesture provides a central model for architecture's expressive power. So much so that Wittgenstein deploys it to define architecture and distinguish it from mere building. A quote from Wittgenstein, architecture is a gesture. Not every purposive movement of the human body is a gesture, and no more is every building designed for a purpose architecture. End of quote. Sixth point. The SOMA further provides a basic model for the relationship of architectural design to the environment. An architecturally successful building must both fit in and stand out as a distinctive achievement, just as a SOMA must do in order to survive and flourish, performing a balancing act of absorbing and relying on the wider natural and social resources of its environment, but at the same time asserting its distinctive individuality. Just as we always experience a building in terms of its background environmental framing, so we cannot feel the body alone independent of its wider umwelt. If we lie down, close our eyes, and simply try to feel ourselves alone and motionless, what we will feel, if we are attentive, is the environmental surface on which we are lying and the environing air we are breathing and feeling on our exposed body surfaces. Point number seven. Such non-visual feelings of the body remind us that if architectural design is based on the soma and aims to enhance somatic experience, it should be critically attentive to the soma's multiplicity of senses. These senses, as neurophysiologists now realize, go beyond the traditional five senses and include some that are identified as distinctively somesthetic senses in the narrow sense of dealing with sensory perception through the body per se, rather than through the body's particular sense organs, teleceptors like the eyes, ears, and nose. If the soma is the crucial medium through which architecture is experienced and created, 
then developing its critical discriminatory powers could enrich architecture's critical and creative arsenal since critical perception is always part of the creative process. It is often said that our term criticism comes from the Greek word for judge, kritis, but it ultimately comes from the Greek verb krino, which means to distinguish, to discriminate, to separate. Hence, the adjective in Greek, kritikos, the counterpart of our term critical, means to be able to discern or to discriminate. Recalling this core sense of discrimination can perhaps help us address, with the help of some aesthetics, two of the more serious current challenges to criticality in architecture. The first being the problem of autonomy and the second being the problem of atmosphere. So autonomy first, um, briefly. Autonomy connotes independence and one prominent spatially derived notion of independence implies a separation from that of which one is independent. That separation is reflected in the notion of critical distance, where the critic sustains her objective judgment by having a point of view somehow external to the object or situation she is judging, rather than being essentially involved or implicated in that situation. The idea of the judge as disinterested observer conveys the same sense of critical distance. But contemporary theory has shown that a purely external viewpoint for judging our natural, social, and cultural world is logically untenable. Such a view would be a view from nowhere and from which we would see nothing meaningfully. We simply cannot stand outside the world to assess it altogether apart from the interests we have and seek in it. Today's thoroughly globalized political, economic, and media networks reinforce in concrete sociocultural terms this message of our essential inextricable implication in the world and the world order. Architects have not been slow to draw the conclusion by questioning the notion of autonomy on which several versions of critical architecture appear to rely. In using the energies, institutions, permissions, monies, and other affordances of establishment society, the architect cannot avoid being somehow entangled and complicit with it. That the architect is somehow a surfer on the waves of societal forces forms part of Rem Koolhaas's questioning of architecture's critical posture, a suspicion that there is in the deepest motivations of architecture something that cannot be critical, and that leads him in the far broader and less manageable field of urbanism to urge at one point a radically uncritical outlook. I quote, we have to dare to be utterly uncritical, we have to become irresponsible, embracing a Nietzschean frivolity, end of quote. Such post-critical arguments may seem compelling if the critical attitude is presumed to require an external autonomous standpoint, altogether detached and disinterested. But that basic presumption can be challenged by recalling the Soma. We can critically examine aspects of our somatic experience without going outside our bodies to some putative, detached, disembodied mind. We use a finger to probe a small bump on our face. We use our tongue to discover and remove the traces of food on our upper lip or on our teeth. We discriminate or assess our pain within the painful experience and not only after that painful experience has passed and we are somehow beyond or outside that experience. Beyond these ordinary practices of somatic consciousness, a variety of meditative disciplines are structured on heightening the soma's conscious critical self-examination. In short, somatic self-examination provides a model of imminent critique where one's critical perspectives does not require being entirely outside the situation critically examined, but merely requires a reflective perspective on it that is not wholly absorbed in the immediacy of what is experienced a perspective that is perhaps better described as positionally eccentric or decentered rather than as external. Such perspectives can be achieved by efforts of disciplined willful attention, but they also often arise spontaneously 
through experiences of somatic dissonance where unreflective coordination is disrupted and thus stimulates a decentered reflective critical attention to what is going on. Critical somatic consciousness involves some aspects of the soma's complex array of systems examining other aspects of that complexity. I could say far more about the relations between unreflective immediacy and reflection in body consciousness and how these different modes can be integrated to maximize the quality of our experience and performance. But retaining the crucial point that criticality requires no position of complete independence or externality, I now turn to a second major challenge to architectural criticality, and that's the problem of atmosphere. Deriving from the Greek words for vapor and sphere, atmosphere's primary meaning is air, thus suggesting lightness, intangibility, a certain formlessness and elusiveness that can readily evoke a sense of frivolity or lack of gravitas, structure or substance. In modernist architectural discourse, the notion of atmosphere had often a negative nuance, suggesting a vaguely subjective quality without clear structural form or function, but also something gratuitous, frivolous, contrived, and artificial or impure. With the decline of architecture's modernist paradigm and its positivist, rationalist, objectivist, and minimalist ideologies, there has been increasing recognition of atmosphere's important architectural role. Architectural meaning and value cannot be reduced to tectonics and definable visual or structural form. A crucial dimension of architecture is what its articulated spaces mean and contribute to the lived experience of those who dwell in those spaces and pass through them. A significant part of that lived experience of meaning and value is what architectural theorists now generally denote as atmosphere. This notion, which deserves extended analysis, seems to encompass the vast array of perceptual qualities, dominant feelings or moods, and ambient effects that emerge not only from the complexity of forms, relations, and materials of the articulated space, but also from the complexity of practices, environmental factors, and experience qualities that pervade the lived space of a building or other architectural structures. The increasing attention given to atmosphere can be traced to new directions in aesthetic theory, but also to broader cultural trends that challenge the traditional emphasis on the weighty, the substantive, the resistant as defining what is truly real. Our new media and technologies with their corresponding new economies and ethos are dematerializing the traditional heaviness of the life world so that the previous the invisible atmospheric dimension of our environments through which our ever more electronically and nanotechnically shaped experience is conducted. This atmospheric dimension now emerges as powerfully real and essential. As one popular thinker puts it, with characteristically errant faith in our unlimited resources, and I quote, it is through the occurrence of abundance in the modern that the heavy has turned into appearance and the essential now dwells in lightness, in the air, in atmosphere, end of quote. We should also remember, however, that airiness has in our cultural history very strong associations with spirituality. This extends even to architecture, where as Peter Eisenman once notes, the airy is associated, is associated with the sublime in contrast to the materiality of the grotesque. Aura, which is also frequently used to convey the notion of atmosphere and derives from the Greek word for air or breath, is often applied with lofty or spiritual connotations. Walter Benjamin's famous theory of arts aura, for example, clearly links it to the elevated religious atmosphere of ritual or cultic use. In recent architectural theory, the turn to atmosphere has been closely linked to the so-called post-critical project. But post-critical should not be confused with acritical. The post-critical turn to atmosphere is also a serious critical response to the perceived limits of earlier views of architecture that denigrated or neglected the atmospheric as irrelevant to architecture's disciplinary practice and mission 
and that defined architects' disciplinarity and criticality in terms of autonomy. Thus, Sommel and Whiting affirm the post-critical trend as, I quote, a move that shifts the understanding of disciplinarity as autonomy to disciplinarity as performance or practice, and that regards the defining core of architectural practice in a broad notion of design that includes qualities of sensibility such as effect, ambience, and atmosphere, end of quote. Atmosphere's challenge to criticality, however, does not disappear even if we take such a more comprehensive, more sensible view of criticism as involving not only negations, resistances, and oppositional attitudes, but also constructive assessments, interpretations, and positive appreciations and projects. Atmosphere remains problematic for criticality because any mode of criticism that claims to be reasonable, principled, and in some sense objective rather than arbitrary seems to logically require some object against which critical propositions can be measured for accuracy and insight. But atmosphere does not provide such an object because atmosphere is precisely something that is defined by its contrast to conventional objecthood. It distinctively lacks the clear contours, firm and enduring substance, and discrete individuality of ordinary objects in space. Nor is atmosphere something that can be reduced to a mere matter of purely inner private space, a merely personal idiosyncratic reaction because different individuals obviously share common perceptions of atmosphere. Theorists of atmosphere have noticed thus that it hovers in an, immediate, in, an, in an intermediate realm between the objective and subjective. Atmosphere, I think, is best understood as an experienced quality of a situation, and such qualities are notoriously resistant to conceptual definition and discursive analysis. If it defies clear categorization as objective or subjective, this is because atmosphere is a qualitative feature of a situation that is typically grasped before that situation is divided into its objective and subjective elements. Atmosphere is experienced by the subject as a perceptual feeling that emerges from and pervades a situation. And like other perceptual feelings, atmosphere is experienced in large part as a bodily feeling. Such somatic experience qualities are usually very difficult to analyze because they are not fixed in stable objects and they tend to be felt in terms of nameless, elusive, and often very transient feelings. Further difficulties in critically analyzing these somatically perceived atmospheric qualities derive from the fact that we are not habituated to pay explicit attention to the bodily feelings involved in our perception because the habitual focus of our attention and our interest is in the external world of objects. Perceptual feelings are experienced somatically with different levels of awareness and most of these feelings function beneath full consciousness. While asleep, I still can feel that a pillow inhibits my breathing, and so I adjust myself to move the pillow without ever regaining consciousness. Even when we are awake, most of our somatic feelings and perceptions do not reach explicit consciousness or awareness because our attention is elsewhere directed. In descending a staircase, we are rarely aware of our, kinesth our kinesthetic feelings of movement our proprioceptive feelings of balance and extension in space, and the tactile qualities of contact that our feet make with the steps. But we must at least implicitly feel these qualities for the soma to react properly in coordinating our movement. Such implicitly grasped qualities exert a significant influence on our behavior, attitudes, and moods. They constitute the core of atmosphere, which also often affects us without our even being aware of it as an explicit dimension of our experience. Many of the qualities that constitute atmosphere are not simply somatically perceived, but also relate to senses that are distinctively bodily, namely our proprioceptive, kinesthetic, vestibular, tactile senses. Our sensory experience of architecture is far more than the changing visual input 
as we survey and traverse its spaces. There are feelings of light and shade that are felt in our flesh and not just through vision. We feel the different temperatures and movements of air on our skin as we move through architectural space, along with the smells that the air brings us that stimulate the senses in our nostrils and mouth. There are also all the tactile and muscular sensations of walking through the space. The feel of the surface material beneath our feet, the rhythm of our footsteps, the kinesthetic feel, proprioceptive balance, and muscular effort of traversing a courtyard or ascending or descending a staircase, or simply adjusting one's gait and posture to negotiate a narrow corridor or a low door. As the soma is trained or, habituate, or habituated to adjust to different kinds of space, at once physical and social space, so the soma implicitly reacts proprioceptively to the changing kinosphere without one usually noticing it. And such reactions often have an affective dimension with real aesthetic significance and socio-political import. A huge kinosphere that dwarfs the visitor entering the space of an authoritative power, a demanding staircase to approach the elevated throne of authority, provide familiar examples how, of how architecture can instill an atmosphere of majesty that is at once potently aesthetic and political. If architectural theory recognizes that the more tactile somesthetic senses are crucial to architecture's experienced atmosphere, the presumption nevertheless remains that these dimensions of atmosphere are in principle too elusive for the exercise of criticality, except indirectly in terms of its pernicious political uses. The locus classicus of this influential presumption is Walter Benjamin's famous account of architectural experience that contrasts tactile and optical perception while also comparing architectural experience to that of film. Unlike painting, with its traditional aura of uniqueness, film and architecture both enable a simultaneous collective experience for aesthetic reception by the mass audience. But Benjamin then contrasts film and architecture in terms of the former's greater possibilities for critical consciousness through the film's objectifying representational photographic technologies and its optic, optic focus as opposed to architecture's problematic resistance to critical consciousness through its predominant reliance on habits of tactile reception. I quote from Benjamin, um, buildings are appropriated, and the German term is the less dynamic rezipiert. Buildings are, let's say, received in a twofold manner, by use and by perception, or rather by touch and sight. Such reception cannot be understood in terms of the attentive concentration of a tourist before a famous building. On the tactile side, there is no counterpart to contemplation on the optical side. Tactile reception is accomplished not so much by attention as by habit." End of quote. We should note how Benjamin's terminology does not even give tactile experience the full status of perception. Uh, his term is Wahrnehmung, which connotes cognition and active consciousness, but instead suggests blind absorption, reception, through the mechanism of habit. Benjamin goes on to argue that this unthinking, uncritical, tactile absorption through habit, also I quote, determines to a large extent even optical reception in architecture." End of quote. Moreover, through its persistent deployment in the ubiquitous realm of architecture, this uncritical mode of habitual somatic reception, Benjamin writes, acquires canonical value or pervasive power that extends to other domains of culture and of life, where in times of great historical change, the challenge that faces human perception and adjustment cannot be solved by optical means, that is by contemplation or focused attentive consciousness alone." End, end of quote. 
Benjamin can then return to film experience and argue that there too, reception by the masses, though optical, is still essentially a reception governed by habit and characterized by distraction that thus requires no attention and has no criticality. Thus, the mechanical reproduction of art is matched by an unfocused, absent-minded, uncritical reception through the mechanism of habit. Benjamin, however, provides no real evidence that the tactile feelings we experience in architecture must remain in the realm of inattentive, absent-minded, mechanical habit that precludes explicit awareness for critical assessment. There is nothing in tactile and other distinctively somatic feelings that prohibits our perceiving them with conscious, focused attention. And in many conditions, we do. In everyday experience, we often notice and even try to describe varieties of pain, itches, tickles, caresses, sensual pleasures, feelings of dizziness and speed, hot and cold, and the feel of different surfaces and fabrics on our skin. Benjamin, of course, is right that her habitual way of experiencing architecture is in terms of blind, inattentive habit. But habits, as learned behavior, even when they are only implicitly learned behavior, can be changed. And not all habits are blind and inattentive. Though Benjamin understandably contrasts habits with attention, there are indeed habits of attention. And developing such habits is an essential key for success in education and in life. It is certainly true that most of us are far better at focusing critical attention on visual representations than on tactile or somesthetic feelings. And there may be reasons for this beyond the effects of mere habit. There may, for example, be evolutionary reasons and factors concerning the way that distance and visual spatial array can facilitate individuation and objectification. But we should not erect a dualism between optical and tactile perception, because the former, in fact, intrinsically involves the latter. The very act of vision necessarily deploys the muscular movement of our eyes and thus the tactility of proprioception, or feeling of muscular movement. Moreover, as research in the visuomotor neuron system has shown, perception is significantly transmodal, such that seeing an action will also activate neurons involved in the motor or muscular performance of that action, and apparently vice versa. If Benjamin argues that a habitual and absent-minded tactile reception of architecture has rendered its optical reception likewise inattentively distracted or absent-minded, then why not turn the tables and argue that by heightening our attention to the tactile or somesthetic feelings of architectural reception, we could render such perception not only more acute, penetrating, and critical, but also sharpen our attentiveness and penetration of, architectural's, of architecture's optical experience. It is an anatomical fact that one's rotational range and ease of vision can be increased by improving, through pro proprioceptive sensitivity, the rotational range of one's spine. Moreover, by training and exercising somesthetic attention, we can gain a more attentive and explicit consciousness of the vague but influential somatic feelings that constitute our experience of architectural atmosphere and thus gain a more focused, more discerning awareness for the critical analysis of architecture. Such training is valuable for improving the critical sensibilities, not only of designing architects, but also of the various populations who inhabit architectural spaces and whose informed input on architectural design would be useful if such design is truly meant to serve them best. There are a variety of methods for training such somesthetic sensibility. Some of them I discuss in my book, Body Consciousness. But they are best demonstrated in workshop settings and not from the podium in huge lecture spaces like this, 
whose atmosphere is decidedly inappropriate for such training, in which I'd also need to take much more time and demand even more acute and patient attention than you have already granted me, and for which I thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, Nietzsche says that uh, so far, and he's of course writing in the 1880s, so far philosophy has been not much more than a misunderstanding of the body and uh, possibly one could argue the same thing about architecture. And I'll ask you, invite you to ask some questions, uh, but before we go to those, I would want to ask one fundamental question, and perhaps this comes from the wrong philosophical school, partly. But still, I would like you to take, um, define your position. Namely, um, you gave some good reasons why these somatic uh, experiences would have been less um, articulated than some, other, some other, other properties of our experiences. But I would like to, um, like to approach this question of um, the somatic experience in architecture rather from the direction of Hermann Czech, namely from the direction of the, of the production, as it were. Uh, what I mean is that, that um, <clears throat> obviously the some aesthetic qualities apply not only to the architectural experience but to any other experience. And what is important in, in the some aesthetic approach as well as in, let's say, Gernot Böhme's um, um, aesthetics of, of atmospheres is that one is no longer focusing on this very traditional uh, work of art as the only object that you can think about. However, we do have something which I would never call a discipline, but we have some sort of patterns of activity. There are painters, there are composers, there are architects who do certain kinds of things. And from that point of view, it's sort of interesting that obviously everything that you said about architecture and the multi-sensory nature of the experience of the environment would obviously apply to any other uh, experience as well, including, let's say, music. If you are in a concert hall and it's unbearably hot and it's noisy outside and so on and so on and you are really hungry, all of these things will somehow, you will be aware of many of these things. Perhaps you will not be aware of all of them, but they might still play a role. But we would not say that's part of the music. And, I, and, and the reason why we wouldn't say this is part of the music probably has something to do with how that particular musical piece came into existence and what the role of the author would be. So we individuate certain properties from our total experience and we focus on these things as a critique of music, for instance. And the same <coughs> could then be the case of architecture. And this comes, I finally come to my question, which is, could it be that these kinds of qualities have been largely neglected because of a lack of a notational system in the sense of Goodman or Beardsley. That that's the reason why, because architects cannot manipulate these things and prescribe, prescribe them in a precise fashion, that they tend to be ignored. This would be the question of the production of the, of the architecture rather than the reception. And uh, the assumption, my assumption is that the work of art is individuated through the process of production and not the reception. Okay. Um, there are a lot of things that I could respond to in that. Um, start with the biggest. I agree. It, this approach um, could be applied to all the arts, including the art of living. Um, I don't think that's a problem. I, I see that as an advantage. It's just um, the details you would have to work through differently in the different arts. Um, I've had patients, clients who were musicians. I haven't had, I haven't worked with any architect yet, so I don't have any um, clinical experience to um, work on. And the clinical experience that I have is really um, with musicians uh, and other 
people is not in what you would call their creative moments. It's more instrumental so that they can work easier and longer without pain. Um, and also maybe improve um, certain movements that uh, are difficult for them. With respect to um, the designer versus the perceiver, um, there I think it's a problematic um, division because I think a designer is also a perceiver of her work. Um, a big part of creation in poetry, in music, and uh, again, you know, I am not an expert in architecture, but I would imagine that it's a big part of the creative process is the critical process. You make a design, you make a draft and an envelope, and then you kind of think it out. Is this good? Will it work or not? So I think um, this kind of sensitivity, it's an education of the senses. Um, I think it goes into the creative potential. It increases the critical and I think also creative, it can. You know, there's no guarantees. This is what I said at the beginning. The last thing I want this position, this option to be seen as an arche or uh, the end all and solution to all the problems. It's just one of many um, methods that can be used. I think that if, and this I'm coming to your other question, I think part of the reason uh, why there isn't a notation is because of the difficulty in um, perceiving. And I think there's reciprocal influence. Because we don't have names or terms or signs for those feelings, it's harder for us to perceive them. Because words sometimes help us perceive things. That's, that's one of the great um, gifts of poetry. Uh, new words uh, enable us to mm, feel things in a more precise way and maybe have new kinds of feelings. But on the other hand, um, I think sensibility can help give you the tools to distinguish things so that then you can mark the distinction with some kind of sign, you know, whether it be word or whether it would be um, a gesture. But let me just one, I'll, I'll come to the questions. Just one uh, further question. If we think of a musical piece of music, okay. we are talking about acoustic properties in particular when we're interested in music. Well, you know, but, that, but, yeah. but let, let me okay. just continue. Um, we have two kinds of artists who are often uh, part of a, a process of a piece of music being performed. We have the composer and we have the performer. And what they do is they ultimately produce things that will affect the acoustic phenomenon. And yet we divide between the performance uh, of the composer and we see it differently from the performance of the performer. Even both are producing aesthetic qualities and we would, could praise both for their aesthetic uh, performance. Uh, so here it's not a question of articulating different kinds of properties. It's a question of, uh, let's say, a division of labor, as it were. And that division of labor, I believe, is based on, on the system of notation. Yeah, no, I, I think that's true. What I would say is that, um, as music historians uh, tell me, and philosophers of music as well, is that the concept of the work, you know, this kind of individual work that is separated from the interpretation and from, also you could add, because part of the musical experience is also the reaction of people, I mean, it could be, you know, an opera with mitzingen, um, it could be, I mean, the idea of individuating and isolating the work, this is a historical phenomenon, and is the work that sort of absolute um, Platonistic work, um, 
notated with notes but not adequately because you can play all the right notes and not produce uh, an authentic example of the work. But even if we isolate that and say that is the work of music, that doesn't mean that that's the only valuable aesthetic object of music because it could be not the work but the performance at a particular time and you don't want to hear the work, you want to hear that performance, whether it's a rock concert or whether it's a classical music concert. So even if, I mean, I think notation has a lot to do with it and um, I think before we get to notation, uh, we need to work on these other um, sensibilities, but I think I, I don't, this is another dualism that I um, want to reject with great vigor, even if I don't sound very vigorous now. Um, and that's the dichotomy between body and language. Um, I believe that you need to do and not talk. You know, that's why when I say um, about doing workshops, you know, I enjoyed the workshops here, but for me, a somesthetic workshop, people would be lying on the floor in comfortable clothes and they would be doing things. Um, but it's not something that's totally without language because there would be instructions. And without instructions, it's very hard to guide people to the sorts of experiences and new um, ways of moving and feeling. So um, lang just like spontaneity and reflection shouldn't be opposed but used together and integrated. The same thing with um, non-discursive work and discursive work. Language and body are not enemies. One shouldn't um, swallow up the other. Yeah, if, I, if I understand you correctly, then you said <coughs> in your reading of Benjamin, um, that the uncritical status of the somatic experience that Benjamin describes, you attribute mainly to um, a habit of uh, experiencing um, architecture, for example, a habitual experience. That, that, that I think, is, is a big part of it. Um, I think, as I said, it's easier, I think, um, to objectify and individuate things in a visual space that's more removed. In, in general, and this is true about the body, we have more control over the distal parts than the proximate parts. You know, I can do all kinds of things, most of us can do all kinds of things with our arms and legs. But when it comes to like complicated movements in our trunk, it's very hard. So I, I think there may be through evolution or other sorts of things, um, factors besides habit that make it easier to be visually critical than critical in the other senses. But I think um, habit, um, or you can call it like second nature, um, that's what Helmut Plessner, I mean, habit is a very big part of what we are. Um, this is one of the dangers. I mean, I, I didn't inv invoke um, Foucault and Bourdieu, uh, and I can raise a question that um, I would have addressed if I wanted to go beyond my assigned speaking time, which is how can we develop um, critical awareness when we are being indoctrinated by a big system which trains our perception. Um, in a way, I mean, the visuality. No one here, um, I am sure, uh, has 
the intention of um, contributing to the imperialism of the specular in our society. But yet, it's all about looking at images on a flat screen. I know that architects aren't only about flatness, but it's again, it's the system that's larger than us. But so, I mean, that's, that's a question that I will raise for you. I, I don't know, I, I shouldn't take, try to take the time to answer it, but it's a question that I'm aware of, is how can you develop the critical um, distance through body consciousness when your body is being shaped by social forces that are encouraging you, pushing you to avoid that awareness or focus on only certain senses. So besides habit, that's another thing. Evolution and... Mm. Yeah. But may, is it possible that um that this is exactly due to the lack of a notational system for um, the somatic or no. bodily experience? I, because I, yeah, I, I don't think so. I don't think the problem is a notational system because um, a notational system needs to be built on something. I mean, actually, Wittgenstein has some interesting remarks about that in um, his lectures on aesthetics. Uh, where he considers, and where he talks about aesthetic, um, aesthetic criticism, like he talks about architecture in terms of gesture. Uh, I am not advocating uh, a notational system. I think the idea of having one um, could be helpful, but I don't think, I don't feel that we're ready to go there because I don't think we have, um, I think a notational system is going to be based on experience. I mean, it's very easy to make a notational system. You know, it's just like um, you can have two symbols. You know, there's this and there's everything else. So you have a notational system, one and two. The question is having a refined and useful well, I, I, yes, in yesterday's evening lecture, for example, I got, <clears throat> no, the, the day before yesterday's evening lecture, I got, the, I got the notion that the empire, and also in the lectures before, that precisely the empire rules because of the power of symbols and of maybe of cliches. That's also what Benjamin says, uh, where he attributes the power um, to, to be mass, uh, um, to be effective in the mass, to the visual sense because you can have visual sh shortcuts, cliches, uh, signs, and that can be easily developed. And if you look at the, that what seems to be the architecture of the empire, then we see that increasingly uh, it uh, goes back to simplified signs and uh, mega signs, so to speak. And, but there seems not to be any equivalent of that, although, um, although, uh, um, for example, um, Böhme uh, tries to sort of establish some kind of a language of moods. At, le at least one could read that in there. But there hmm. seems not to be, um, due to the lack of a notational system. Well, I mean, you're making a jump from, um, if you want to include discursive language as a notational system, then I think we're ready. But I, um, I think that we need practice in describing our feelings. Um, and I think through practice and through sensitivity to what they are, I mean, William James, uh, if you ever want to read a wonderful, I mean, he's not known as a phenomenologist, but William James in his um, landmark book, The Principles of Psychology, he is a real master. I mean, I think novelists are also very good at this, that we can learn from them about it's not an artificial notation, but it's a refined, um, poetic, but still accurate description of certain feelings that can, when you read it, you recognize it. And yes, you know, that helps you feel it again. I mean, James gives an example 
um, that sometimes if you give a word to a quality of something, he, he gives two examples. I mean, I think uh, we had in our workshop this morning um, a paper on wine. Uh, wine is one example where you don't have a notation, but you have descriptions. Now, sometimes the descriptions are, you know, like really crazy, but sometimes, very often, the descriptions of what the wine is like really helps you sense that extra, you know, the, the tint of raspberry, you know, the extra tannin, the leather. Um, the words actually help you um, feel that sensation. And so, yeah, I, I think we need to develop a language. Uh, notation, I, I thought that might be like more technical and I think we need to start. I, I'm an ordinary language philosopher, you know, trained in Oxford. So I have a kind of um, default preference to, um, not necessarily for English, but for natural languages before I jump to uh, rational reconstructed languages or mathematical um, diagrams. Okay, one final question, then we do have to move on. Hello. I uh, didn't hear the full speech, um, but it sounded like maybe you were saying we could benefit from an awareness of our, of our inner body. Do you think that a that if we developed this our inner awareness and developed a language for it, uh, we would produce different kinds of spaces? Well, um, I I'll answer the whole question, even though you didn't hear the whole speech. Um, I would put the modality different. Um, first of all, I, I think we, need, we can be aware also of our body, not just the inner, but you know, the outer. Um, it's not easy to um, divide them. But the modality would be, I don't know if we would, I think we'd have better tools to, um, because we'd be more sensitive to spaces. I mean, um, I think uh, we, let's leave aside um, all you talented, sensitive architects, right? Let's, you know, let's assume you're all perfect, you don't need any improvement. The question then comes, um, if you want to be the kind of architect and maybe you don't have them here, but I think there are in some parts of the world who have a sense of a flexible architecture with input from the public who is affected by that architecture. If you want to be responsive to that public, and you don't want that public to suffer, you need to have an informed public. Because if they don't know, if they don't have the sensibility and the sensitivity to know what a space is going to do to them over a period of time, then they won't be able to give you the right kind of input. Okay? So uh, even assuming that everyone in this room is perfect for designing, uh, if there's a a democratic impulse for some architects um, to work from the roots, to grassroots input from local publics, what they need, what they like. Um, it's also good to educate uh, them so they can be more precise and sensitive of what they like, which might not be what they see on a television screen. Um, so I don't, um, 
I can't guarantee anything, but I think we're in a better position. It's the same thing in politics. We're in a better position if we educate ourselves as part of the public, but also the wider public. We can have better results in democracy through better education. You know, that's, that's my sermonize. That, that will end my sermonizing for today. <laughs>